Okay, time to start again. Um, and uh, we have Simon Josefsson from Ubico in Sweden here. And uh, Ubico is the creator of the YubiKey. Looks like this. And to me, it's a keyboard. And I leave, leave it to Simon to explain the rest of it. <laughs> Uh, I've got we one should, of these at home, and uh, well, uh, we should, should we say audience. it could be a secure alternative to RSI security? Yeah, there's, should, there's one more. Pull the audience, anyone else? No? Yeah, with, with you. Okay, so you had many people to come in, so that's yes. So, stage is, is yours. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. <coughs> uh, so, I'm Simon Josephson from Yubico. Uh, just briefly about me. Um, uh, long time free software hacker working for several GNU projects and other free software projects and also active in ITF for on standardization issues. Um, but uh, I work for Ubico right now. So briefly about Ubico, I'll, I'll skip mo more of the most of the sales stuff because we we won't we're a technical crowd so focus on the details. But we were started in 2007, a um, relatively small company. But the key invention is this, the UBQ. So, as you can imagine, this is a one-factor authentication device. It's a hardware dongle, and we have lots of customers. So, this is what I'll be talking about for the first part. And the second part is our new invention, uh, a thicker UBK, or it's a UBHSM. So it's a, if this is the key to something, this is the lock to, to put it in, figuratively speaking. Um, they'll come back to the UBHSM later. Um, I'll go over the UBK first. So the, there was one, two people here who had a UBK. How many have heard of UBK? Okay, so it's a, a couple. Um, how many have used some kind of hardware authentication device like Rusk or SecureID or, or anything? Yeah, a lot. Okay, but back to the UBK. So, so this is a device that generates one-time passwords uh, and it's as an identification part and an authentication part. I'll come back to later what, what that means. But, um, so it's, it's no batteries, no display or, or mechanical buttons, so it doesn't break when used in the sent by post or mail or something like that. So typical usage is replacing the password login prompt with, with something like this, or combining the password prompt with, with a second factor. And this is what it generates. So it's an identity part that's static on all invocations, and there is a variable part that's different every time. So just just a quick quick demo. So so this I insert this into a spare USB port. And just launch a text editor. I touch the button. It simulates a USB keyboard, so it simulates sending the C, C, and so on. So this is why it works on, on practically all platform that supports USB keyboards. So if I press again, the first part will be static. It's the same. The second part it will vary. So so that that's to to simply know how, how it works. Um, so the, these characters are encoded uh, in mod hex because keyboards doesn't uh, return A or B, it generates scan codes and these are translated into A and B by the computer. And th this was a problem for us in the beginning but because there are a bunch of keyboard layouts that are different. So we have to find some characters that are mapped from scan codes to characters the same on all keyboards. This is not, not essential to understand this, but it's the background on, on why 
the, the string looks the way it does. So we have to find 60 characters that are unique, and we are mapping them to normal hexadecimal alphabet. So, yeah, so <coughs> string 00 is CC mod hex, and we call it mod hex because it, it's essentially a hexadecimal but with a different alphabet. So, the UBK OTP consists of the the first part is actually a variable, 0 to 16 characters, but we ship them with 12 characters and I have standardized on that. Um, so this is the blue part here, and the varying part is actually an AS encrypted part. I'll come back to that later. So, so having a variable identity part can cause problems because if you're Lots of situations like SSO login or Windows login, you're entering a password and then generating a one-time uh, passcode. And then if the pass of the P one-time password varies in length, it's different. Difficult to know where the password ends and the one-time password begins. There's a silly problem, but it causes a lot of issues in, in deployment. So we are standardizing on 12 characters here. And there. So, um, so what's in the one-time password? Um, these are the internal fields which are then encrypted using AES in standard ECB. How, how many are familiar with AES? There are, yeah, secure to seven people. So, so but the YubiKey works by generating a plain text uh, block. It's, it's just one AS block. And it's consisting of an internal identity, which is just a, like a serial number. It has a session counter to make the one-time passwords unique every time, and it's incrementing. And it has some, some timers. These are incrementing when the UBK is inserted into the PC. And there's yeah, not a counter, and some unpredictable data. And a CRC, uh, and no, well, the CRC is not used for anything security critical. It's just a checksum. So, but sometimes a problem comes up because people say CRC system is is not secure, but it's not it's not used in a security sensitive way. Um, and once the UBK has compiled this block, it's encrypted using AES in ECB mode, and so. There is a unique AES key in every one of these devices, and you can program it yourself, so you don't have to trust us to to, to protect the AES keys, unlike some other companies. Sweetie. Um, so these counters um, are used for the. There is a event-based counter part, which is incremented. Uh, every time you touch the button, basically, it's it's for for implementation reason. It's divided into two parts. One that's non-volatile, that's just incremented on first use when you're inserting it, because non-volatile memory is you don't want to write to it a lot of time. So, uh, and another counter that's incremented during that power up cycle. And, and that goes away when it's disconnected. Um, the time timing information is there to, to be able to see if you are generating a one-time password at now and, and in five minutes, the server can see that, com compare these two one-time passwords and see that <coughs> these were generated with five minutes interval. And that's, that's useful to, to be able to identify phishing attacks or something like that. Someone stole your OTP. But it's not real real time clock. So, so you can't say that it, the user inserted it at 12 o'clock today and pressed it, but you can measure the interval between. And it, in practice, that, that's, that's sufficient to, to detect most attacks. So I'll talk briefly 
this, this device is configurable so you can configure it in a static mode and then it generates the same password every time you touch it. And of course that's quite silly because you, then you're back to normal username, password and problems. And with key loggers uh, and having, it's even worse because you only have one physical device and you're likely to use that static password on, on many different sites, which is bad practice. But turns out that this is very useful for demos and for user acceptance testing. So you can configure 50 of these in static mode, give it to user who doesn't understand this, and just to see how they react. Is it possible to use it? Sometimes departments or companies want to do a pre-study to understand if it's going to work or not. And then you don't have to change anything on the server, you're still using passwords essentially, but you can see how, how users behave and, and act. And we also support OF. How many are familiar with OF, HOTB? Not so many. So, so briefly, this is a standardized way to do one-time passwords. It's, uh, it's based on HMAC SHA-1 um, and, and essentially just HMAC SHA-1's a counter every time. And that's generating. So now OTP on this scheme looks like this. This is similar to, to a lot of online banks are using, perhaps not HOTP, but similar algorithms. And this is an um, uh, open standard service, so anyone can, can read it and implement it. So, so we support this since, well, yeah, 2009 is quite a long time now. And recently we also support challenge response, so you can send something into this and, and get the signed, something signed out of it, because that, that's often seen as a weakness because this device doesn't sign anything coming from the server. It's just sending something to the server. But uh, this challenge response mode requires drivers on the PC. And we are, we are not really, we have added this feature but we are not pushing it strongly because we are feeling that this is a, if you are not happy enough with the security provided by this, you might have a too strong security need and then you might want to go look for alternatives like certificates or smart cards or, or something else because the, the focus here is just to do simplicity and do that well uh, and there is, a, there is a niche there that we, we believe we aren't met today uh, because a lot of solutions are focusing on solving just the, the most highest security solutions like, like smart cards. But then you end up with smart card driver problems. So, so but we've added this so, so people can experiment with it. And some people are using disk encryption like this because then they can unlock their disk encryption using a hardware download. So, might be some uses for it. Uh, we also combine it with RFID to, to combine it with physical. Um, I won't go into logistics a lot, but we have automated the process to to to, to manufacture these in large quantities quickly. Um, so Ubico provides a whole range of things around the Ubico. Of course, we sell the Ubico in different variants. We also provide software. Uh, yeah, variants, several variants of software. First, to talk to the device, then also to use it. And we have set up an online validation service. You can validate the OTP against our servers. I'll come back to some, some examples later. Also have some forum and support. So I, I mentioned that you can program this device yourself uh, and we have personalization software. We have a written in C, it's a free software project on, on Google Code 
well, uh, actually it's hosted on GitHub now, we're kind of moving it. Um, and we also have Windows software for, for people who like Windows. And actually Mac as well. So, and then you can configure it in static mode, uh, or HOTP mode, or, or normal UBK mode, and set your own AS key, and so on. So, of course, if everyone can reprogram this, it's a problem if someone installs a Trojan on your device and just reprograms it with, with some AS key done by the, some attacker. So, so normally you would program it and then set a lock code and then it's locked. And you need to provide the lock code again if you're reprogramming it. And because Reprogramming a UBK in normal deployments is so difficult you know, just to have a thousand employees coming in with their YubiKeys and to reprogram it, it, it's quite costly. So we recommend you just set a random password and, and discard the password, the lock code, because it's easier to, to, well, of course we like to, it's easier to just buy more YubiKeys and send them out than to bring them in. And, but yeah, of course, it, it's an option. But, in practice, it's very difficult to manage sending back things and sending them out to the right person again. Uh, so looking at some software packages, we have packages that parses these one-time passwords written in C. Uh, yeah, you see some are C programmers who recognize some, some prototypes too. Um, I have planned a demo, but I often can skip that and focus on the UBHSM. Yeah, it's it, it's not very interesting. You can try this if you're really interested, because it's just a matter of reprogramming it, um, or just ask me later if you're curious. Um, so I mentioned this, this is a key. It needs to go somewhere. It's useless to have a key without having it unlocking something. So we are providing uh, a validation server to, that can be used to build this. Uh, so, so we have a validation server where you can send in these OTPs and get a yes, no answer. So, so basically, you because says that, okay, this is our OTP that's valid right now, and then you can build some application that does some authentication or authorization based on that. And Yubico is not managing passwords or anything like that. We are, of course, if you send in the same OTP, you will get the response no, and it says reply to OTP. We have different, different kind of error codes. And it's accessible over HTTPS, or we have a crude ad hoc scheme to, to do a HMAC SHA-1 sign of, of the request. It's simplest used to HTTP as the standard, standard protocol. So this requires client identity and key and you can regenerate it from my pages. Um, so let's try a theme. I don't have an internet connection. <coughs> Not sure if this is possible, but you can go to this site. Yes yubco.com slash demo and then as a prompt and you insert the device, generate the code and hopefully this page will show where it's just congratulations you're logged in and it will show the response from the validation server. So of course did yeah. Uh the timestamp that comes from the host computer, right? Uh, no, this timestamp actually comes from the server, our server, in, in okay. this case. So, uh, uh, it's not a problem if the computer you, you have locally have a, their own time? No, it, do, it doesn't really matter because it, it's it's not part of any... It's not part of any of no, the key? Okay. No, Good. but uh, normally you, when you're designing something, the server, our server of course runs at the P and L yeah. good time. And, and your application server that has the same requirements. But that, that's all on the server side, so, so 
Yeah, good. So that's usually not the problem. Um, if you are a common line kind of person, you can just use widget to, to, to access our web service API. And here we are validating the same OTP three times. So first time we get an OK and with some hash response, and then we get a reply that we play with the video. Yeah, same again. So, so this is what we are providing to, to allow you to build something, to build the lock. And we have improved the validation protocol with, with some replication and distributed and so on. It's, it's not particularly interesting. We have a lot of different clients in, in many languages, C, PHP, Java, .NET, um, almost anything, Ruby, whatever. So the, the server-side software that we are using or, or used to use our free software, we are now migrating to the UBHSM based solution, which uh, that, that's also free software, but this is the old old software running. So it's divided into two parts. It's a validation server that's responsible for, for doing the saying yes or no. And there's a key storage model that's responsible for, for storing the AES keys and just responding, taking one OTP and responding with the decrypted part. Because that's that's very easy to, to distribute because the AES keys can be found on several places. And it's also important to secure them to you once you really lock down the secure stuff where you're holding the AS keys. So that's that's available. And uh, this key might help to, to understand how, how the how it works. We have a few servers that's holding the AS keys. And since since that's there is no synchronization synchronization between these machines. It's possible for the validation server because the validation server needs to decrypt the OTP in order to validate it. So each validation server can, in parallel, query all our KSMs to do a decrypt. Uh, and this will take the first response that comes back and use that for, for validating the OTP. Uh, and your client, your, your application, like a I don't know, a WordPress blog or, or a bank, online bank or internal web system will access our validation API. Or you can set up this in your own environment and, and access your servers. Um, I should mention uh, several of our customers are writing their own backends because they, they, are, they have, for example, some, some are very deep into Java and have their own Java environment already deployed, so it's it's, it's easier for them to, to re-implement this in Java than to try to make our system work in their environment. And uh, all of our, everything that you need to do to, to re-implement it is public, so it's, it's just a matter of implementing. And this is, you can do this in a hundred lines of code, it's not, it's not, a, it's not very complicated really. So this was the scalability that I mentioned. The client queries several validation servers to, to deal with network outages. Uh, and these in turn talk to the KSMs. And they synchronize the OTP counters between them. So we have a, also have some online to PHP forum to, for discussion and a wiki. Um, if you want to raise questions or, or share with someone else something you've done with the wiki. So we also, how many are familiar with PAM? So, so we, essentially it's a plugin architecture for, for doing authentication in, in mostly Unix system, but it works on Windows as well. Um, and we have a PAM module for this, so you can use it for login to your PC or, or configure SSH for remote login 
or, or anything that where PAM is used, like radio servers, weekends, or yeah, PAM is quite well used. Um, of course, we we like to see the YubiKey used everywhere, so we're supporting uh, all kinds of authentication, identity protocols. An open ID was a uh, was something that appealed to us uh, a couple of years ago. It is kind of faded, but uh, it's still quite used. And we, we did our own OpenID server. Uh, that's just one factor. So, so you can have a OpenID URL, which is asserted by one YubiKey. Uh, and that's free software that we published as well. So some are setting up their own OpenID server to to be able to look in to, to sites. Oh, maybe I should ask, how many have, uh, have heard about the OpenID? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, <coughs> so that's our server. I won't deal with that. We also support SAML, which is a long way coming. It's, um, I don't know when it started, around 2000 or something like that. But it, it's more industry response to, to, to federated authentication. Um, there's a bunch of implementations of it as well, and, and people have integrated support for the YubiKey as well in them. Um, so simple sample PHP is a Norwegian project, and, and I, I like the design of it, so, so we are we, we are using that, but some people had done some integrated into OpenSSO, and we are now using Shibboleth to, to integrate UBK support as well. This is just examples of where UBK can be used. So, any, any questions on the UBK before I begin with the UBHSM? Yeah. Just, um before, when I looked at the YubiKey, what wasn't really clear is that you get a key, and you can programming with an AES key, yeah. and then you also have free software that allows you to manage this, to set up a framework for identity management, so that you can have the key and, and match it, no, the, the encryption key, and you can match it to, to an ID. Yeah. Is, it, yeah. Is, is that ID, is that part of the... Um, is, is, uh, the the information you get out of the key when of the Yubi key when you press the button does that have a sort of serial number that yeah or how how does that yeah technical so, part yeah so so I should mention uh, of course that there is a physical name of of, of every Yubi key and that's a serial number and that that's a way of being firmware that you can't modify that but that's not part of the one time password you can modify the the public prefix. Of course, it's useful to somehow relate the serial number with the public prefix just for for administrative reason. But, but there's no, you don't have to do it that way if you don't want to. So so you are free to modify the first part. And we so, some customers are actually they they reserve part of the, of the prefix for their own use, and they are deploying UBKs within that public prefix. So, so. so the, the fixed part is not the user ID that you type in, is this correct? Or yeah. So N normally it's a user username yeah. and password. The the fixed part is not the one that goes into username. No, uh, normally not. So you would have to type that by hand, or how does it work? Yeah, I, it can be used in, in, in two ways. I, the normal way is that you have a standard username uh, prompt, and the user types John or Alice or whatever. And then in the password prompt, they type their password and, and generate the one-time password code at the end, and it presses enter, sub submit the field. So, and of course, that's a bit annoying because this provides identity, so the user doesn't have to type in Alice, um, in theory. But often, often you come to a situation or, or existing 
uh, pages where you have two windows, uh, and then it's easier to do it that, like that. But so is it possible to embed something like a tab or an enter in the fixed part? Yeah, you, you can program this to, to actually output the identity part and a tab and then the one-time password if you want. Uh, and that's actually was the default configuration initially because we, we thought it, it would be the natural solution, but we later found out that it doesn't work in, in many different environments like Windows login or SSH where you where tab doesn't mean anything. So, so now we are just combining it one long string. But uh, I should admit, if you're designing a new web application, you can just have one field and the user provides either just the one-time password or types a password plus the, the one-time password. And then the user doesn't have to, to input her username. And then <coughs> users find, find that very nice. Because it saves them time. Uh, and I, I mean, we all know the problems of remembering passwords, but it's a, it's a common user problem to record the usernames. And they don't really know what, what username they have in all situations. Do I understand correctly that if you use this with several verifiers, you have to have a different YubiKey for every verifier? It depends. I mean, if you're going to our validation server, you don't have to. The, the important part is that you only have one central place that validates all one-time passwords coming from one YubiKey, because otherwise there is a replay attack. If someone gets a one-time password for, from one system, they can replay it to another. But if, if you are building web applications, you can use tens or hundreds of different sites all going to our server for validating a YubiKey. So, so that's not a problem. But if you are building your own infrastructure, that, then you have that problem. You can't use it against our system and your at the same time. So, because the one-time password in here needs to be synchronized <coughs> with a component that's validating it. Well, let's say that my bank buys the YubiKey and my university also buys the YubiKey and so on. Yeah. I have to have a different one for each of them, right? It depends on how, how, how friendly they, they want to act. Uh, we, some customers like to do everything their own, set up their own servers. Then it's not possible to, for, for their employees to use the YubiKey elsewhere. But, but some more, more open organizations like university are, are using it against our server. So, so yeah, students can use YubiKey for, for internal login to the IT system at the university, but they can also use it to log in to our forum sites or lastpass.com or, or any sites using the YubiKey. So it's it. The organization buying the YubiKey really decides. And of course, we, we like, like for the YubiKey to be as useful as possible uh, so you don't have to carry around a bunch of them. Well, of course, we like that too, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we realize that users will find that annoying. So, so, uh, and that's why we're trying to help OpenID SAML, because that can aggregate this on a different level. Let's say bank buys this, they want to run all their infrastructure themselves, but maybe they can set up a SAML server or an OpenID server to, to allow their users to, to use the open ID, the YubiKey against some other sites. Yeah. Are there any plans to switch it to uh, Bluetooth instead of USB? Yeah, we, we have that request a couple of times, but the problem is uh, there is no battery in here. Yeah, I so, we, we have thought about different ways, but the battery is not the only problem. The Bluetooth pairing process is quite cumbersome, and it, we, we really like this to be simple. And, and as soon as Bluetooth and pairing is involved, it, it, it doesn't work well in practice at all. Not if we not if you move between different computers. But. Yeah. Well, and the security of Bluetooth, even with encryption, is really appalling. Yep. So yeah. So it, it's possible to do, I and mean, we have prototypes of it. But we, we, we if you're buying a 
10,000 of this will we'll make it, but <laughs> we haven't seen these kind of requests so far. So, so yeah. yeah. OK, so more questions. One question. Yeah. Um, on the communication between uh, the YubiKey and the server, on the answer, there was something which looked like base64. Yeah. It was the H, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So like, can you tell what's inside? Yeah. So, well, here you see the request, and that's the yeah. OTP. Um, this is just the H equals, and there's a that's just the signature on this rec the response from the server. Okay. So, so the client specifies uh, identity when it talks to the server, yeah. and the server knows the the shared secret for that client. ID and then it signs the response with that. It's initially it was just a way to to avoid the need for HTTPS and do this over HTTP, but it, it's not. I wouldn't recommend relying on this. It's okay, but this could could so the answer be forged? Well, if you are using HTTPS, then you are depending on on HTTPS yeah. and, and certificate validation, and then you are into that. A separate problem, but it's, it's a welcome problem. But, but otherwise, if you don't want to use HTTPS, and some people dislike it and, and prefer our HMAC variant, then you can uh, verify the response by using the HMAC key. Uh, so, so when you're registering for a key, this is either one, but when you're registering, maybe you'll get 5,500 or, or something. Then you have a HMAC SHA1 key that you can use to verify the responses. So it's a cheap way to, to, to get some improved security, but, but yep, yep. Uh, so I was planning some questions at the end as well. So, so I'll run through the UBHSM part and then there are some questions. So, <coughs> As you have seen, the problem with securing the server side is something um, that prompted us to do this UBHSM. So, so what what is the UBHSM? It, it's a I have it here. It, we are beta testing this right now, and this is essentially a, how many are familiar with the HSMs in general? So. HSM stands for Hardware Security Module, something like that. Uh, and it's normally used to store encryption keys outside of, of a PC because you're not trusting the PC enough to, to, to protect the encryption keys. So you put the AS keys in some physical machine and you have a tight interface between the PC and, and the HSM. So that, that's traditional HSM, and there, there are a bunch of them on the market, and they cost a lot, and, and then they cost every year as well, so they are quite expensive. And we were considering this uh, for our um, servers, because we want to improve the security on there, so we don't end up, you know, well, so, someone attacking us and stealing our AS keys. So we were, were exploring what's on the market and we didn't find anything that's really suitable. So we came up with this. And right now it, it does AS encryption, decryption, and decryption compare. <coughs> I'll come back to, to what, what that operation really is. It does the HMAC SHA1. Um, and it also has a random number generating based on, <coughs> on one of NIST's designs. The, there is a bunch of different deterministic random number generator, and it's it, it's a matter of choosing which of them to use. But uh, the DRBG is one of the few nice ones, in, in my opinion. So the, this device is able to store 40 keys, uh, has a fairly small interface. You can see what is the, it's, yeah. 
H front shell on the other end, ground on the other end, the other end ground on this. AIC, easy to block encrypt, encrypt, uh, and so on. So, and these are the operations you can do with the UHSL on the key. And the intention is that you can't read out the, the key from, from this once it's configured. And we have Python, um, Zoom, Java code. Um, yeah, it's completely documented. So, so the background was really that we wanted to improve our home security. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think I'm going to this. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that the traditional HSM are quite expensive, but another problem is that they don't really do. They just do encrypt, decrypt. They don't. They can't take a UBK OTP, decrypt. Uh, the OTP and verify it. And we really wanted that because if some attacker gets root on your host, and even if if the AS keys are, are in a HSM, they can just pipe whatever on the disk through the HSM and get out the <coughs> clear text AS keys anyway. So we weren't feeling very protected by having a HSM. Um, yeah, so, so we really wanted a model where someone who would get root on our machine still wouldn't be able to do anything. Uh, and I think we've succeeded is to, or, or achieved this to, to a fair, fair degree. The, um, we can publish the whole data store on the PC for everyone to see, and you still couldn't do anything with it unless you have access to the hardware. The UHSM, SM, HSM, protecting it. So, so the indirect mode that we're using, because the, the, this device only stores 40 keys, so we have to have some way to, to support millions of AS keys. And the way we're doing it is that we are key wrapping the AS keys in one key that's stored here. We're using a uh, one of the AEA, AEAD cipher modes for the ASCCM for that. Uh, how many are familiar with authenticated encryption modes in general? Well, not many, but it, it, it's a new way of, 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 of encrypting that's also authentication, or authenticating the data. And it has some nice cryptographical properties. Um, so, so we're using this to store this AAID encrypted blobs on the server. And then when you get the request, you're sending in the request together with this blob to the UHSM. Decrypts the, the blob, performs the operation, and returns the result. So, so, so and we want something that provides integrity and not just encryption. So, so a lot of you are probably interested in how, how you would build a server that validates password for a million users without being vulnerable to, to attacks like Sony or someone else stealing all the information. Um, and now, one scheme to do this is, is something like this, that you're <coughs> hashing or, or salting the password as soon as you get it. You Query some server that has a UPHSM with the passwords encrypted using this AAID scheme. Uh, and the server will, will do a AAID decrypt compare using that blob and the input to the hashed password, and it will return yes, no. And even if an attacker would get root on this machine, they would be able to steal the blobs. But to decrypt them, those blobs, then would need to, to have the keys stored in here. And our model is that we are not concerned with physical attacks. The, some people are, but there is a traditional security industry out there to protect physical stuff, uh, and we kind of let them do that. And on, on our level, we are not concerned, but if someone is able to, to circumvent the physical security of our 
hosting centers, they, they are able to do a lot more. So, so it's a matter of finding the, the nice threat model or that you're concerned with. So I was over this fairly briefly, but maybe we can go back to this. So, I mean, we are, we are solving one problem, but we are creating some, some things to consider. And you really need to manage the keys in these UBHs more carefully than, than anything else, because if, this, if these keys get lost, then some attacker getting these AAD blobs will, will be able to decrypt them. But it, maybe it's easier to, to protect one key than a million keys. Um, so normally you would generate, you would have two of these, and you generate the same key in both devices, and you use one of them to, to encrypt these blobs in one place. And that's the server that's responsible for, for setting passwords. And, and that's only able to create these AAD blobs. And on the second half, or, or the second UHSM, you is only able to decrypt and compare it using this key. Okay, that was quite brief, but I think I'll move around with a minute or so. Yeah, are you more questions? Thank you. Any questions? Okay, well. No.